In this video, I'm going to show you a fantastic game ending with a brilliant combination in a top level game of Belgium's Grandmaster Daniel Darda against top Grandmaster from Azerbaijan, Shahi Mamadiarov. And the reason I'm showing you this game is some extraordinary tactical combination happens at the end. Normally you can see it in, in puzzles or in textbook uh, games showing beautiful mating attacks, but this is just a real modern masterpiece you definitely don't want to miss. And if you want to see more of these games, make sure to subscribe to the channel because I love to cover these games. It's definitely my favorite game of, um, of the last couple of months. Let's have a look. Darda starts with uh, 1d4 and we get knight f6, c4, g6. Sharp opening. Is it going to be a Grunfeld or King's Indian or maybe maybe something else? Anyway, white played here the move h4. Really sharp move. And it's a modern treatment of this um, Indian uh, opening with the move uh, g6. It's not that white is really threatening to play h5 right now, but in certain cases, it's nice to have the pawn already there so that it can get in touch with uh, black's uh, king side. And there are various ways to respond. There's no time to cover it all in, in detail. One of the interesting ideas here is to play the move c5, so you can even get maybe a Benoni or a Benko uh, Gambit. But Mamdiarov goes for the principled move bishop g7. And now knight c3. And here, interesting moment, because in so many of these Fianchetto openings, the question is whether you're going to play d6 or play a move like uh, d5. If you play d5, you can uh, get um, some sort of variation of the Grunfeld. But here, h5 is a very good move. This is very annoying as you're threatening to advance the pawn to kick the bishop. And uh, you don't want to take with your g-pawn. That's very ugly. While taking with your knight allows y to capture the pawn on, uh, on d5. So that's a small idea what you may expect in this uh, in this variation with an early h4. Mamadi Yarov doesn't want to get this kind of theoretical battle, which maybe his younger opponent is, is looking for to get a lot of sharp theoretical moves. Mamadi Yarov has his own interpretation of this opening. Plays the move knight c6, provocative move, as white can play any time this move uh, d5 and uh, kick the knight around. But first, knight f3 played. Still a move like d6 is, is possible, of course, to uh, get a King's Indian type of formation. But in the game, Mamdiarov goes for a castling kingside. And now the move d5 played, attacking the knight. The knight goes to b4. The knight cannot really be trapped. It can uh, just get to the side of the board any, any time. Let's have a look. g3 was played. Not sure. I mean, even e4 occupying the center with all your pawns also comes into consideration. But g3 played. And now e6, challenging that uh, that pawn on uh, d5. And that was the main idea of Black's provocative move, knight c6, to force the pawn to come forward. And now you can uh, can challenge it. White played the move a3, and the knight goes back to uh, to a6. And later on, the knight will probably come back into the game via c5. If uh, white ever goes b4, you got to watch out this diagonal doesn't get too vulnerable, particularly the knight on c3 would be a bit loose. So white continues with bishop g2, pawn takes d5, white recaptures. So white retains a nice uh, space advantage in the center. Rook e8, placing the rook on the half open file, castling king side. And here knight c5 was played. So the knight is coming to uh, e4 any uh, any time soon. And uh, well, that looks quite uh, quite reasonable. And the interesting thing is that consciously black has refrained from placing his pawn on d6 for a long period of time. He first wanted to get that knight back into the game, but refraining from that move gives white the possibility to, um, to play here the move d6 himself. And that's a very sharp positional continuation because it's not like you, you really want to trade off the pawns, but you want to restrict that bishop from uh, c8 getting into play and the question is whether this pawn is becoming an asset or a liability later on. Black, play the move c6. And the idea is to challenge that pawn with your other forces. Maybe a knight can come to e4, but also moves like rook e6 or, or bishop f8 can be played. So black is going after that pawn on d6. What should y do? I think a move like rook e1 would be uh, quite nice with, uh, with the plan of advancing uh, the pawn in, uh, in the center very soon. Was not played um, in the game. In the game, there followed knight d2. 
It's the kind of move you often see in um, it is Fianchetto openings as white gains full control over the e4 square. But at the same time, you're slowing down your own development, especially the bishop on c1 and therefore also the rook on a1. They cannot uh, join play anytime soon. Black plays a5 to uh, secure that uh, knight on c5. It cannot be kicked out by white's b pawn. So therefore the pawn only goes one step forward, goes to b3. Rook e6, you're attacking the pawn and protecting it with knight c4 runs into the move b5 and the knight is uh, not looking great on uh, on c4. So instead white play the move queen c2 and that's a pawn sacrifice. You're giving up your pawn on uh, d6. The pawn was taken and um, white continues here with the move knight c4 attacking the rook. Rook goes back to e6. And where is white's compensation? Well, for me, it's not entirely clear. I think black is in good shape because if white, for, for instance, proceeds here with bishop f4 and attempts to install a knight on this square on d6, d5 can be played any time and black is breaking free, places the pawn in the center, other pieces can be developed. So I think, objectively, things may not have gone exactly in the way white had been hoping for. White played bishop e3, attacking that knight. Knight doesn't have that many great squares to go to. If it goes away, then the bishop and the knight there are eyeing this b6 square. So that's the sort of compensation White is looking for. But bishop f8 can be played. And the bishop is supporting that uh, knight on, uh, on c5. And I think this is a critical moment in the game, as uh, White could definitely have uh, pushed there a bit with, with b4 was not played in the game. I will show you one line. After pawn takes, pawn takes. You're attacking the knight. Knight goes to a6. And you do get a piece on, uh, on the b6 square. But anyway, after moving the queen on the next move, d5 will be played soon. There is a bit of compensation, but white is only trying to hold the balance here, fighting for equality. The move played in the game is a move I really absolutely dislike. He played bishop h3, Darda. I understand you're getting a tempo, but the rook is happy to go back uh, anyway to uh, to e8. The rook has done its job. It's just picked up the pawn on uh, on d6. Now it's safe on uh, on e8. B4 played. So if the knight goes away, once again we have these ideas to install a piece on on b6 or even win the pawn on uh, on a5. But now, beautiful move played by Shahriar Mamadiyaev, ignoring. The threat, playing here the move d5, attacking the knight on c4 and opening up the diagonal for the bishop. So the bishop on h3 is also unprotected. Now bishop takes c8 was played, queen takes c8. Everything is still hanging. Knight on c5 can be taken, which was done in the game. Bishop takes c5 was played. There's also knight b6, it's a knight fork. So your knight is safe. Attacking both the queen and the rook. But black's idea is to come in with the queen to h3. And if you take the rook now, it's knight g4. And there's nothing you can do against checkmate on uh, on h2. So that shows that you have to be careful. And now white's light squared bishop is seriously missed. You can feel the absence of uh, the guard of these uh, light squares. In the game there followed bishop takes c5. And now you can take the knight on uh, on c4, which is interesting and absolutely fine for black. But Mamdiyarov is not a materialistic player. He is looking for more and he understands that the king on g1 is vulnerable. Sacrificing a piece, he goes for the move queen h3. With the same idea as we have seen already. Knight g4 is the plan, threatening checkmate on h2. And it's very difficult to cover that uh, square. So white has to bring back it's knight. The knight is uh, now um, safe. And after bishop takes c5, b takes c5, you're still a piece up as white. Knight g4, threatening checkmate on uh, h2. The knight comes in to f3. And it seems as if white is having everything under control. But white's position is totally dependent on that knight on f3. If the knight is not there, it's likely going to be checkmate. So the question is, how should black get rid 
of that night. And maybe this is something which had been overlooked in advance by, uh, by White. But the next move by Black, guys. Ooh, this is brilliant. Rook e3. With the threat of taking that knight off the board, making use of the fact that the rook cannot be taken. It runs into knight takes e3, attacking the queen on c2 and threatening checkmate on g2. And both threats cannot be stopped at the same time. Therefore, this move, rook e3, sacrificing a piece on an empty square, but with a devastating threat. These are the most beautiful sacrifices. Usually, you, you just take a piece or so when you put a rook there. Now, you just put it on an empty square, intending to take that knight. Only move here is rook fe1. And the point is that if you eliminate that knight, which is not good, there is e takes f3. You can give a check on h2, but after king f1, Queen h1, the king can run away via the center. And after rook e8, king d2, white is a rook up and will eventually convert its material plus. Let's take it back. You understand with rook e1, you're opening up the path for the king to escape. So we have to be very precise as black with the right execution of this um, idea. But you're not in a rush. Rook a e8, bringing another rook into the attack. And that's a beautiful idea because, of course, the rook can still not be taken because of knight takes e3 with a fork on the queen and the mating threat on g2. The question only is, does rook e8 have a clear purpose? Well, if white is playing a random move, let's say you move the queen away to attack the rook on e3, then there is rook takes f3. And after pawn takes, you go queen h2, king f1 only move, and there's queen h1 with checkmate as the rook on e8 prevents the king from coming to the e-file. That is the main idea of getting the rook to uh, to e8. Beautiful shot. And well, there, for instance, if you, instead of playing queen d2, you would play knight d1 to attack the rook with your knight, then you can take on f3 as well, because after e takes f3, the rook on a1 is no longer protecting the rook on e1 because of that knight hindering the protection. It's rook takes e1 with checkmate. So white's position is really bad and there's not much you can do against the threat of rook takes f3 followed by queen h2 and queen h1 with checkmate. Therefore queen d3 was played, very desperate move. The idea is that now you can just take the queen of course. Don't take the knight. If you do so, the queen comes out to uh, f3 to guard the uh, h1 square. After queen h2, king f1, mate has been uh, prevented. So of course... No longer the mating attack, but you can just take the queen, rook takes d3, e takes d3. And well, we have a position with a rook and a knight for the queen. You may just go for simplifications by trading off rooks on e1. But now the great tactician Shahiyam Amadiarov stands up, play the move rook e3, again a rook sacrifice on that e3 square. That's just a fantastic idea. With the point that if you do take the rook, it's queen takes g3 and wherever the king goes, if you go to f1, it's checkmate on f2 with the queen and knight. If you go into the other direction with king h1, it's checkmate on f2. Beautiful mating pattern once again. So with rook e3, we renew this idea of eliminating the main defender. If you take with your own rook, there's knight takes e3. Threatening checkmate on g2. If you take on e3, why does a rook and two knights for the queen? But there's queen takes g3 with check. If the king goes either to h1 or f1, there is queen takes f3. You'll pick up all the material. There are a lot of more checks coming. This is completely hopeless in the position with queen versus rook and knight. The queen is way too strong. So what an amazing game. After rook e3, Darda resigned. And... What do you think about this game? Do you like this combination? I think this was just splendid. Absolutely stunning, stunning mating combination you see sometimes in books. But if you can play this in one of your own games, that's, that's such, a, such a pleasure, of course. Let me know what you think in the comments. Subscribe to the channel. And definitely soon more of these kind of beautiful mating attacks.